Hello, and welcome to QuantPy. In the previous two presentations, we analyzed the arithmetic Brownian and geometric Brownian motion stochastic differential equations. We gave a step-by-step -step derivation of their solutions and probability distributions, including mean, variance, covariance, and densities. We then showed how these processes can be calibrated using historical data, and we then outlined how to simulate their sample paths and how to generate their probability distributions. In this video, we are going to cover the same concepts for the ornstein ullenbeck process. However, as this process is mean reverting, we also derive two additional properties. We first answer the question, what happens to the mean and variance, as t tends to infinity. We will call this, its limiting distribution. We will find out that, as the process is mean reverting, its mean tends to its long-term mean, as t becomes very large. No surprise here. The variance formula also simplifies, considerably. But one then, can naturally ask how large, the horizon must get, for the process to have this limiting distribution. As in radioactive decay, this question is more meaningfully answered in terms of, half-life. The equivalent here would be, how long would it take for the mean of the process to reach the level halfway between its current value and its long-term mean? The answer will turn out to be very simple. That is a long list, so we better crack on. But before we start, let's check how our understanding of the geometric Brownian process with a simple question, which goes as follows. Essentially we want to know the covariance between the growths of the process in two non-overlapping periods. As usual, please answer in the comments section. Let's start with the ornstein ullenbeck SDE, which is as follows. It is sort of, a modification of the arithmetic Brownian. The diffusion term, which is the second term, is the same, but the drift term has got more elements now. Eta is the long-term mean, and kappa is the speed of mean reversion. It is easy to see that the direction and magnitude of the drift is not constant, but changes, depending on the difference between the value of the process, and its long-term mean. At any given point t, if x happen to be lower than theta, the long-term mean, then the drift would be positive, its magnitude would be proportional to the mean reversion speed, and of course the amount of difference. And, if x happen to be higher than theta, then the drift would be negative. Again, its magnitude would be proportional to the mean reversion speed and the amount of difference. Thus, the drift forces x in the direction of the long-term mean. To solve this equation, let's first consider the deterministic version of this equation. We just remove the diffusion term. Moving x to the left-hand side, we get. This equation is in differential form, so let's write it in derivative form to make it look like how it is usually presented in ordinary differential equations. Here, x is a function of t. You might have seen this equation in terms of y as a function of x, but the meaning is the same. We also replaced kappa times theta by b, just to make it look less intimidating. This equation is usually solved via the integrating factor method. This method essentially finds a factor that would make the left-hand side an exact differential. The integrating factor is the exponential of the integral of the coefficient of x. As kappa is constant here, the integral is easy to calculate. Multiplying the equation by this integrating factor, we get, as expected, the left-hand side is now an exact differential, or the derivative of the product of, two terms. This can be easily verified, by applying the product rule, and simplifying the resulting expression. We can write it in differential form, to facilitate comparison with our SDE. We apply the very same technique to the stochastic version now. Expanding the first term, we get. Moving the term with x to the left, we get. The integrating factor of the left-hand side is the same exponential of kappa times t that we calculated for its deterministic version. The left-hand side becomes an exact differential, as one can easily verify by applying eta's product rule, and noting that the cross term is zero, as the covariance of a deterministic function, and a stochastic term is zero. Integrating from zero to t, Evaluating the integrals. 
multiplying by the exponential of minus kappa times t, to isolate x t, we get. And moving x0 term to the right, we get the solution. We now, characterize its probability distribution. We reproduce the SDE and its solution first. It is easy to see that x, is normally distributed. One just needs to recall that the integral, of a deterministic function, with respect to Brownian, is Gaussian. Let's calculate its mean, variance, and covariance. Taking expectation of both sides and noting that the expected value of a deterministic function with respect to Brownian is zero, we get the formula for the mean. For variance, let's reproduce the variance formula. Well, subtracting mean of x, t, from its solution, leaves us with only the stochastic term. And then straightforward application of Ito's isometry rule gives us a deterministic integral that we can easily evaluate. Rearranging, and noting that the exponential of 0 is 1, we get the desired formula. We now derive the covariance formula. Let's reproduce the solution first. Recall that the covariance of a stochastic process represents the covariance between the value of the process at, say, time t and another time, s. We can write the covariance as follows. You can easily verify this by recalling the covariance formula from elementary statistics. We know x. And we know its mean is just the first two components. Thus, subtracting mean from x leaves only the stochastic component. For x, s, we can rehash the same formula. All we have to do is to replace t with s. And if you don't have time to go through these steps, then you can recall from statistics that the covariance between two expressions, each being the sum of a constant and a random variable, is equal to the covariance between the random variables. The constants do not make a contribution. Now let's evaluate the expectation. Taking the deterministic terms out of the expectation, we get. Assuming that, s is smaller than, t, noting the covariance over, non-overlapping period, is zero, and applying Ito's isometry. We are left with a deterministic integral, that we can easily evaluate. Rearranging, by taking the exponential inside the braces, we get. We just need to simplify it now. We assumed s to be smaller than t, we could have equally chosen that, t is smaller, and the calculations would have been similar, except the first exponential would have then, s minus t, instead of, t minus s. We can thus write the more general formula, using absolute value. If s is greater than t, we get, s minus, t, and if t is greater than, s, we get, t minus, s. We now move on to, the limiting distribution. Let's reproduce a solution, mean, and variance, for convenience. As the ornstein ullenbeck process is a mean reverting process, it is interesting to see what happens to the mean and variance as t becomes large. Recall that the solution describes the value of the process at t given its value at time 0. So essentially it is adding all the changes in the process from time 0 to time t. When we make t large, it means we are adding the changes which are mean reverting over a very long period. You can easily speculate what the long term mean would be. Variance is slightly subtle, but let's find out. Before we start applying the limit, recall that the exponential of the negative of a positive variable tends to zero as the variable tends to plus infinity. It is easily visualized by plotting this function. Let's calculate the limit of the mean first. Interchanging limit and sum, we get. Now both the exponential terms go to zero as t tends to infinity, and we are left with theta, the long-term mean. No surprise there. Let's apply the limit to the variance then. Taking the limit inside, and recalling that the limit of the exponential is again zero, we are left with this simple expression. The variance is inversely proportional to the speed of mean reversion. This can be explained by the fact that the higher the speed of mean reversion, the higher the drift towards the mean, which means lower variance. 
Now that we know what happens to the distribution, as the horizon increases, we can ask how long the horizon need to be for the value of the process to show this distribution. We know the answer is infinity, but infinity is not a meaningful answer. To get a more meaningful answer, one uses, as in the analysis of the life of the radioactive material, the concept of half-life. So we instead ask, how long the horizon should be for the mean of the process to be halfway between its current value and its long-term mean. To answer the question, let's reproduce the mean formula. Recall the current value of the process is x0. The long-term mean is theta. The halfway point is as follows. This is easily verified. We want to get from x0 to theta. The distance between the two is theta minus x0. And half of this is just this distance divided by 2. But since we start at x0 instead of 0, the midpoint is x0 plus half the distance. The question is now operational. Find the value of h such that the expected value of x at h given its current value equals this halfway value we just computed. Substituting the expression for the mean. Rearranging the left-hand side to factor the exponential. Moving theta to the right-hand side, and combining the terms. Simplifying the expression in the numerator. Eliminating the common term, we get. Taking log of both sides. And isolating h on the left-hand side, we get this simple expression. It depends only on kappa, the speed of mean reversion. The higher the mean reversion speed, the shorter the period needed for the mean to reach the midway point between the current value of the process and its long-term mean. Up to this point, we have assumed the start point to be zero and the end point to be time, t. Let's reproduce the mean and variance formulae. These give the mean and variance of the value of the process at time t, given the information, at time zero. We can generalize this to an arbitrary start time t and end time t plus delta t. Now the value of the process at time t plus delta t, as seen from time t, is normally distributed with this mean and variance, so we can write its value as follows. Now if one interprets delta t as the length of interval between successive time series observations, such as one day or one week or one year, then it is easy to see that the process is similar to the autoregressive process of order 1 or AO1 process in time series analysis. Writing it in terms of y will make it more obvious. The epsilon represent the errors, which are assumed to be normally distributed. Let's detail the mapping between the parameters of the two representations for future reference. As in the previous two videos, we will now try to get some feel for the ornstein ullenbeck process by using it to model real financial data. We will use Brent data with semi-annual frequency. Now, we saw that the ornstein ullenbeck process is a continuous time analog of AO1 process so we will regress the Brent price against its own lag values. First, let's generate the lag series. It is, simply, the previous value of the series. We repeat the calculations for the full history. Now, let's reproduce the two representations. And the mapping between their parameters. The plan now is to fit the AR1 process to the data, and then invert the mapping formulae, to get the parameters of our stochastic process. The AR1 process, is a standard time series process, and can be fitted using several alternative approaches, such as least square, maximum likelihood, Yule Walker, and so on. We will leave it to the time series experts to decide which one is the best, and will fit it using ordinary least square. Fitting least square is easy. The slope, B, is just the sample covariance between the two series, divided by the sample variance of the lag series. One can also use, slope function, in Excel, and in numbers, to compute the value of B. The intercept, or A, is just the average value of the dependent, minus the estimated value of B, times the average value of the lag series, or you can just use the intercept function in the spreadsheet tools. 
the standard error is the square root of the sum of the square of the residual divided by the number of observation minus the number of parameters. Now that we have the parameters of the AR1 process A, B and standard error, we will need to invert the mapping formula to get the parameters of our stochastic process, that is, kappa, theta and sigma. We will invert them one by one, starting with B. We take logs of both sides and then isolate kappa on the left. Plugging in the values B equal to 0.781 and delta T equal to 0.5, which is half year, we get kappa. Now moving to the A. Plugging in the B for the exponential from the previous mapping and rearranging to get theta on the left, we get. Plugging the values of A and B from the regression results, we get our theta. Finally, let's invert the standard error formula to get the sigma. Substituting for kappa from the first inverse formula we derived and rearranging, we get sigma in terms of the parameters we have already determined. Substituting the values of B, delta T and standard error, we get sigma. Note that as we already know kappa, we could have done this inversion directly. Now that we have the parameters of the stochastic process, we have practically nailed the SDE, its solution and its distribution. The sample paths and the distributions can be generated easily using the same procedure we used for the arithmetic Brownian motion. Granted, that the mean and variance formulae here are slightly complicated, but computers won't care. So to save time, we are not going to repeat the simulation of the paths here and leave it as an exercise. We instead comment on the uses of this process. In physics, the ornstein ullenbeck process is everywhere. In quantitative finance, it is widespread as well. One encounters it in the Varsicek short rate model and its Hal White extension. It is also used in modeling foreign exchange and commodity prices. And it also gets used in modeling the dynamics of volatility. You can find more about its uses in the Varsicek and Hal White model under the short rate section of the QuantPi website. We hope you enjoyed the presentation, and we will see you in the next video, where we cover the Brownian bridge.